So how can you change the meaning of an opcode with a bit without breaking the consensus? How can you change the meaning of an opcode with a bit without breaking consensus? You can do it, but only in one direction. You can only tighten the meaning of an opcode. You can take something that was valid and make it valid in fewer cases, but you can't make it valid in more. If you make it valid in fewer cases, new nodes will evaluate that and be more strict in their evaluations. All nodes will accept it because it's still valid by the old rules. That's called a soft fork. So, um, check sequence verify was actually replacing op nop seven, I want to say, or three. I can't remember. One of the nops. What does nop do? Nothing. That's why it's called nop. It's a no op, right? So if you take something that was a knob and now you give it special meaning, every other old system is going to read this and it's going to go a number, a knob, a drop. Eh, okay, we're so far so good, and we'll keep going. It won't enforce the meaning of lock times, but it will still evaluate the script validly, right? That's a soft fork. So old nodes don't see the additional meaning. So you can you can tighten consensus rules. By redefining something more specifically, you cannot broaden consensus rules and make previously invalid things now valid, because then the old nodes will reject it and fork themselves off the blockchain. That would be a hard fork. That would be a hard fork. Now, um, in the case of redefining the null dummy value, the bug check multisig, old nodes any value will do, including zero. New nodes only zero. And therefore, there is never going to be a conflict between them. Right? If you put in one, all the new nodes are going to reject it, so they're going to enforce that consensus rule against you. But all the nodes are going to go, eh, whatever, it looks valid. Right? That's a soft fork. So all of these things have been soft forks. It appears now we can do anything with a soft fork. Uh, someone has even suggested doing a change in the 21 million coins with a soft fork. Soft forks for the win. Uh, questions. This is this is it. I'm not doing any more. So we're just going straight into Q and A. Um, Does drop take up more than one? Sorry, Does drop take up more than one. Uh, you can do two drop. Two drop is another opcode that takes two off. It's a, the double drop. Uh, I don't know if there's a three drop. I haven't looked it up. Probably, maybe. I don't. Know. So this stuff kind of reminds me coding in assembly. Yes, it is very similar to coding in assembly. Is there any movement towards making a compiler that could perhaps help? It's a no, because you can't make a compiler into a higher level language for the simple reason that because this is not Turing complete, it's missing one fundamental construct, which is there's no loop construct. There's no recursion construct either. Without a loop or recursion construct, you have a language that is not Turing complete, which means it cannot express all possible programs. If you take a higher level abstraction language, that means that many of the programs you can write in that simply do not have an equivalent in this. So, with Turing complete this, any symbolic language that is valid and consistent can be translated into any other symbolic language that is valid and consistent. That is the meaning of the Turing theorem, um, universal computing engine. Uh, this is not Turing complete, therefore you can create a compiler. Probably a good thing, because the compiler would hide details that would end up causing you bigger problems when you compile it down to this. You'd have unanticipated consequences. Can you yes. guys wait for the mic? Oh, oh yeah, we're not picking. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Denise. Let's do let's do formal Q and A now. You have to speak into a mic. Um, I hope I repeated some of the questions. Um, if I didn't, sorry on the video. It was wanted, really good too. I just wanted to make a, wanted to make another esoteric point. Yes, please. Because I, I wrote an interpreter for all this, and I had to do. Fantastic. With it. Yes. Else and endif are not opcodes. Sorry. Else and endif are not really opcodes. They're not opcodes. They are syntactic sugar yeah. uh, that has no function in the language yeah. other than to delete. They're like the curly brackets in C. They don't actually do anything. They just give you the boundaries. Their scope. Uh, identifiers. They define the scope um, of a function for syntactic purposes. Very good point. Yes, thank you. So, with the activation of SegWit, uh, it's clearly shown that Bitcoin is a lot more than money. Yes. Uh, could you talk about that? Your opinion? 
and, and specifically how entrepreneurs are dealing with this, the outside factors? Well, SegWit isn't activated. Um, we'll see. <laughs> Um, you may have noticed there's a bit of drama in Bitcoin. <laughs> bit of drama. Um, so SegWit itself doesn't really change the nature of Bitcoin being able to do a lot more than money. There are other technologies that have redefined it as more than money far long before SegWit. Uh, probably the two most influential were the original implementation of colored coins which allowed you to give an additional attribute or coloring to a specific value to mean this Satoshi is a share of IBM, this Satoshi is a share of Microsoft, and tradable as such. It's like putting a stamp on a dollar bill and giving it a different meaning. Um, not in exclusion to its original meaning, it's still a Satoshi that's spendable. You just be an idiot spend it as a Satoshi when it's worth so much more through its coloring. Uh, colored coins came out in 2013, I want to say, or maybe 2012. Um, huh? 2013, No, before that though, there was the um, EO PBC specification, uh, which I think was even even earlier than that. And the second one is all of the second layers that are um, enabled, either with op return or through hacks, like Mastercoin now named Omni, Counterparty, and all of the other things that can trade assets and give other meanings. So my point is, it's just data moving between data, back and forth. Uh, Bitcoin is a transactional state engine that, among other things, also transmits value. It is a non-Turing complete transactional state engine, as compared to say, Ethereum, which is a fully Turing complete transactional state engine. Um, but it is a transactional state engine, and you can do a lot with an abstract state machine. Yes, uh, microphone back there, please. What is the best way you found to write scripts and test them, test their redemption conditions? Like, do you just submit them to testnet and try to redeem them? Um, yes, you run them on testnet because unanticipated things will happen, and then you'll lose money. Um, one of the things you need to be aware of is all of the things we talked about today, uh, all of them, go inside a pay-to-script hash script. That means they acquire a three address, an address that starts with three, just like multisig. They are part of a pay-to-script hash, which means that the network doesn't see this whole redemption script until you try to redeem it, all you tell it is, here's the fingerprint of what I'm going to use later to test redemption of this. And it has to match that fingerprint, but you don't say what it is. Now, the beauty of that is you can give it a fingerprint to a completely shit script, and the network will go, fine, I'll lock up your coins with that. And then you go back to redeem it. You say, here's my fancy redeem script, and it goes, uh, it's invalid, your coins are lost forever. Yeah, I've had that problem. Right? Um, <laughs> One of the things you have to be aware of when you're doing P2SH and not validating the redeem script, so the chances of it being redeemable, you know, kind of 50-50 or worse. I was um, wondering if there's any better way to test that. <laughs> well, um, there are five or six um, interpreters. So Bitcoin script interpreters. What's where's yours hosted? Not hosted? There's four or five that are hosted. <laughs> One is called um, WebBTC. It's a it demonstrates the entire function of the stack. You can see things that get popped off step by step. What does the stack look like? What does the script line look like? Similar notation to the one I used. Um, and that, uh, that will do it for you. However, um, it is a simulation. And so a lot of the script interpreters are not faithful to the actual core consensus rules. Which means that if there is a bug, like the check multisig bug that needs, you, you'll read in the fine print at the bottom that it says we don't actually do the the extra pop of an extra value for check multisig, which is great for troubleshooting your scripts, only they won't work on Bitcoin um, because Bitcoin's consensus rules include all of the bugs, and so if you don't faithfully replicate the bugs in your script, it won't work. Um, 
So the interpreter can allow you to experiment for a bit and develop some familiarity. It's more of a learning tool. There is nothing that can test your scripts other than testnet. Uh, testnet is the full consensus rules. That's the only way you can test it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, do you have examples of the different paths through this in the book that are making use of the stack notation you were using earlier? I don't have the full stack, but for each one of these paths, I show what the unlocking scripts are and walk through the various things, including dropping hints about and explaining. So why is that drop there? So it does a full analysis of this over about uh, three or four pages. That says, okay, so how do you do this one? How do you redeem that one? How do you redeem that one? And also, why is the drop there? What does the two do? How does it work out? So it, it's a similar demonstration to what I did today. Um, although you can't ask the book Q and A, so good thing you came today. Thank you, Andres. Hey. Um, quick question. So regarding cryptocurrencies, um, we seem to call everything cryptocurrencies, and clearly it seems. You know, Bitcoin obviously is more than just a currency. Um, what what are your views in the space where there's you know things like Ethereum, there's Eternity, there's a lot of these uh, platforms which are seemingly trying to build these kind of capabilities. Do you view that Bitcoin, you know, in the next four or five years, the, the kind of development that we can see, the kind of creativity that can come from these um, languages, is is Bitcoin still definitely going to be competitive? Regarding that, so yeah, yeah. So that's the that's the yeah, that's the twenty billion dollar question, <laughs> to be specific. Um, I think um, having having worked in programming languages for a long while and having seen what a creative person can do with very very little, I'll give you an example, um, and this is completely irrelevant to cryptocurrencies, but it's a funny story. Um, my first computer um, was a ZX81 Sinclair computer in 1982. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was either that one or the next one, the CX Spectrum. I can't remember which one I did this on. It only had 16 colors. I think the first one only had eight. 16 colors, not 16 bit color. 16 total, <laughs> right? So it had the color perception of a four-year-old. Right? How many colors are there? Well, there's red and green and no pink. <laughs> no pink for you. Which is really funny because you'd think they'd put pink or at least something skin tonish. I don't want to sound like you know a white privilege. Of course, it's pink, but something skin tonish. A mocha to be more inclusive. Something. No. So how do you do video graphics for your games if your characters can only be bright red, bright blue, bright green, white, black? Right? <laughs> kind of difficult. Um, we ended up with a lot of video characters who had yellow skin, hence Homer Simpson. Um, anyway, very long story short, um, I was dissatisfied with the state of affairs. I was offended, so I made it do pink. And the way I made it do pink was I hacked the video codec and I invented interlacing. I was 11. I didn't know what interlacing was. I didn't know it had already been invented. But I figured if I spend half the time of the video refresh on the TV showing red, and then during the time I'm drawing the other half of the lines, I show white, and we do it really fast at 30 frames per second. What's going to happen? Pink happened. I did that in assembly because that's the only way to do it: 30 frames per second at 11. Um, I did pink. Now the designers of that system had not anticipated pink, um, and I did it for a very, very trivial reason. <laughs> This was not a multi-million dollar project. Uh, this stuff is money. How much creativity can you get with adult, experienced programmers who actually know what the hell they're doing, motivated by really exciting applications and perhaps funded? Um, do not underestimate the creativity of the human mind and what it can create. Lightning Network is the perfect example. No one saw that coming. 
right? And it's ingenious in its simplicity, but also in its depth. It's got a lot of layers to it, and once you start unwrapping, you find more and more. Um, now, there are an entire category of problems that Bitcoin cannot do because it's Turing incomplete. In fact, based on the Turing theorem, there are an infinite number of problems that Bitcoin <laughs> cannot do. Um, and there are a finite number of problems that it can do. But there's a very big number in the word finite. Uh, and sometimes when that number is big enough, you can't tell the difference, right? So here's the interesting thing: we're trying to do scripts. What are scripts? Well, fancy people with VC money call them smart contracts, <laughs> right? As you can see, they're not that smart and they're not that contracty. They're just scripts. But this is a smart contract for a governance program for a three-person partnership with a recovery plan and a grandfathering. Plan and key rotation and all kinds of other features. Pretty sophisticated. It's a smart contract. It'd be easier to write in Solidity, but you can't write it in Script. And the interesting thing is, what is the class of problems that you can solve in Script that don't actually need the full-blown Ethereum stack? And I would say the answer is probably 80% of the most interesting financial instruments that correspond to trillions of dollars in value transacted every day. So. That makes Bitcoin relevant for the long term. And the fundamental reason is because this does it at a much higher level of security than Ethereum, in my opinion. Because it's limited. So fewer things can go wrong with this surface. Um, that doesn't mean Ethereum isn't useful. I'm a big fan. Just different problem classes. Yes. John? Thanks, Andreas. Nice to see you again. Yeah, likewise. And I guess for everything else there's rootstock, right? For everything else, there's um, <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, my my question was um, so you you mentioned that uh, softworks can only uh, like make the rules narrower. Yes. Um, and then you also said softworks can do anything. These seem like contradictory statements. Can you explain how how that is? Um, remember that part where I was talking about human ingenuity and surprising outcomes and never bet against the possibility of fitting a very large number in the word finite? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm still shocked at how SegWit was done. I just saw a new proposal for something else today that's a soft fork that was even more shocking than what you can do. I've seen proposals for doing um, soft forks that do quite incredible things that I didn't think were possible. Um, I would have put it past it, like expanding the consensus rules in a, in a soft fork manner. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe it's a contradiction. Maybe it's not. Is this just because they're they're able to like, repurpose the existing opcodes that are in the like base blocks, and then well, and then add some of this data like outside that you know new nodes will be able to interpret? Possibly. I mean, that's what SegWit does. Yeah. And the way SegWit works is rather ingenious. It creates a structure that simply pushes two numbers on the stack. And what you're left with is a stack with two numbers on it. And what does that stack evaluate to? For every node that's not looking at a script, it doesn't have an op equal, it doesn't have a verify, it doesn't have anything. What's the default thing that happens at the end of a stack? Sorry. End of a stack. The thing you don't need to say at the end of the stack, because the stack does it for you. Return. Verify. It does a verify for you effectively, right? So at the end of the script execution, you get to a state where it just takes what's on the stack and says, "Is this a true value? If it is, we're good. If it's not, halt." Well, the definition of true in Bitcoin is any number that's not zero. So you push two numbers onto the stack and then you terminate. That's true. That's a script that anyone can spend. The concept anyone can spend that's defined in SegWit isn't really a concept. It's just how about we just push two numbers on the stack? Everybody who is implementing SegWit will know what those two numbers mean. They're witness script and a version, and we'll interpret them as a witness script as a version. Anybody else will look at them and go, ah, that kind of looks like a true. We're done here. And and that's how you do a soft fork. That's pretty ingenious. I, I was surprised when I first saw it. I never thought of just push numbers on the stack and don't put any off scripts in there and leave the interpretation of that to the nodes that come after. Um, microphone over there. Thank you, I think I uh, 
just came up with a possibly correct uh, way of explaining how res creating restrictions can lead to less restrictions, like to, mm -hmm. to John's question. And may maybe you can uh, let me know if I'm um, making sense or not. So we have an existing consensus in this room that two plus two is equal to four. Mm -hmm. But a group of us can look at that statement, two plus two is equal to four, and say, no, two plus two is equal to five. Uh, and by saying, or, or, or you know, that, that's a little bit confusing because the, the symbols two and two are, are the same thing. So let's say two and three is equal to five. We, we can make another group that says, two and three is equal to six. Mm -hmm. And the more of us that decide that two and three is equal to six, um, we're kind of like organically growing our little consensus group. And eventually if we get big enough, we've kind of like redefined what three means. But the people who used to look at that same sequence of symbols and say two plus three is equal to five, they can still, they can still compute. They can still say yes, when we add 2 plus 3 is equal to 5, we get 5. We can look at that and we can say, well, we've redefined what 3 and what 5 mean, so we get 2 plus 3 equals to 5, but in our language, 5 means 6 or something. Yeah, like you, you can do all kinds of hacks like that. Uh, one of the, so, so there's some interesting plays there in terms of what exactly does consensus mean. Does it simply mean the more nodes that accept it? Um, you know, in, in Galileo's time, consensus briefly was uh, that the Earth is at the center of the universe. And, and most modern history teaches us that that's what people believed at the time. No, they didn't. The ancient Greeks a thousand years before was like, duh, the sun's in the middle. And did, like, yes, and also the distance between us and the sun is so much, and we got it down to 0.3% accuracy by putting two sticks in the ground and measuring their bloody shadows a thousand years before Galileo. Greeks didn't think the Earth was in the center of the universe. That came later. That was a hard fork from reality's consensus. <laughs> Short-lived. We reconverge uh, on the true fork. Uh, but yeah, for short periods of time, you can have weird effects where a whole group of people are persuaded of something that is simply not true, or that is their truth, and they can have their truth. Um, Part of the difficulty we have here, and you'll notice this when we're talking about some of the bugs that are in Bitcoin, is that when you redefine things, so that um, okay, previously op x meant this, but now it actually means you're going to see two more values which define another 150 op codes. So from now on, don't just interpret this, but interpret the drop after and the number after that as, as not drop, and then take the number, and that's a whole new set of opcodes that means something else. You basically jammed another language, right? In the space of one opcode, you could jam an entire language. Um, that's how Unicode works. That's called keying, right? You take one element of the language and you say, all of the other numbers mean what you think, except for this one that means look at the next number that comes, and it gives you another. 256 possibilities, bingo, we just upgraded everything. You do that, you keep doing it. What you're adding is layers of interpretation that overload the meaning of the language. And that creates what is affectionately known in programming as crud. <laughs> and if you allow too much crud to accumulate, you start having side effects, right? Because these things start conflicting with each other, and you have old nodes and new nodes, and they interpret the crud differently, and you create layers. You keep doing that for 20 years. You're like, we still want to be backwards compatible with those guys who are running that little thing back there. And you end up with Windows. <laughs> it's like, we are still, you can run Lotus 123 from 1987. Fantastic. Yes. But I can't run anything anymore. Because in order to do that, you've layered so much crud in the operating system that doing the simplest thing involves wading through the crud of four decades of crud laying. <laughs> and as a result, everything is slow, inconsistent, buggy, full of, um, full of errors and vulnerabilities. And every now and then you just go, how about 
we're not able to run that old stuff anymore. Now, the problem with the consensus layer is you can never do that. You can never do. How about we make sure that Satoshi can't spend our coins anymore? I mean, they've been sitting there for so long, and they've been really quiet. Let's disenfranchise them out of a hundred million or billion, whatever it is now, of their coins. Like. They have some weird rules back then. How about we just wipe the slate clean and say those are no longer consensus? The side effect will be that anybody who had coins in the first 4,000 blocks can't spend them anymore. Unacceptable right, in Bitcoin. That is the difference between hardware, software, and trustware. We are now quoting trustware. Trustware says you have to carry these consensus rules forever. And you have to make sure that the coins that were redeemable then are still redeemable now. That the blocks that were valid then can still be validated by a node now, which means that you keep laying on the crud. So you're going to have a natural accumulation of crud just to make simple advancements. If you then take that natural accommodation of crud, and to avoid a political debate, you add a whole layer of it voluntarily. Well, now you're just you know, making problems for the future. Right? This is the problem with developing trustware. Bugs become consensus code. Fixes to bugs sometimes introduce more crud than the bug itself, so we don't fix them. We just carry them forward. The cure is worse than the disease. And voluntary introductions of crud into the code will be a burden that we carry forever, because once you put it in and someone writes one UTXO that is redeemable by that crud code, that crud code has to be carried forever so that that UTXO can be redeemed in the future. Right? And this is the problem with trustware. Now, there is another approach, and that is the approach that Ethereum is exploring. Uh, don't work. Hard fork. Well, then there was that other hard fork. <laughs> and there is a problem in the client now, because we have 19 gigs of hard fork. <laughs> and that is a different strategy, very effective. I wouldn't bury a UTXO in there for two years. I'd be worried that it wouldn't be redeemable. So there's different strategies to this. We're going to see things that move really fast, things that move really slow. And while you can do tricks like that, you have to consider the future cost. Right? I think uh, should we take more questions or are we done? We're done? I think we're done for now. We have about 15 minutes to mingle, but thank you, Andreas, for your awesome talk.